Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and honored guests. I'm Cadet Mohammed Almeola, and I will be your Master of Ceremonies today. On behalf of the Army, Naval, and Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps units, I welcome you to our 2019 Joint Commissioning Ceremony. To preserve the dignity of today's events, please take a moment to silence your cell phones and other electronic devices. Today is a monumental occasion for the young men and women who will be taking the commissioning oath and pledging their lives to our nation. Thank you for joining us in recognition of this commitment and to celebrate the completion of ROTC instruction and transition into the Officer Corps. We are pleased to have with us today members of the Worcester Polytechnic Board of Trustees and distinguished members of the Worcester Polytechnic Institute faculty and staff. We'd like to ask that uh, you stand and be recognized at this time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please rise and direct your attention to the commissionees at the rear of the tent. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the members of the commissioning party. The commissioning officer of today's event, Major General Maria Barrett, Commanding General, United States Army Network Enterprise, Technology Command. Dr. Lori E. Leshin, President of Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Captain Larry McCullen, Professor of Naval Science and the Commander of Naval Reserve Officer Training Unit Corps, College of the Holy Cross. Lieutenant Colonel Adam Hepe, Professor of Military Science and the Commander of Base 8 Battalion, Army Reserve Officer Training Corps. And Lieutenant Colonel Jack Skiles, Professor of Aerospace Studies and the Commander of Detachment 340, Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps, Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the presentation of the colors, the national anthem, and the invocation given by Chaplain Brooks, United States Army. Military members, please be advised this is being treated as an outdoor ceremony. Salute as appropriate.
Those who would like, please join me in prayer. Most holy and merciful God, we thank you for this day. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. God, we rejoice and celebrate this day, the achievements and the commitments of these young men and women, the newest officers in the U.S. Army, Navy, and Air Force. May this day be monumental for each one of them, a day of celebration, as well as a day to be remembered and to recall their commitments to lead with courage and bravery, as well as sacrifice and integrity. Endow each one of them with the moral and ethical leadership required to serve those who are entrusted in their care and to love them. God, we also thank you for the families, for the cadre, the dear friends and loved ones who have been so monumental in their support and care. God, we pray that that support would only grow stronger as we go forward from this day. We ask for your blessing over this ceremony, this day, and we also ask for your protection for all U.S. military personnel, foreign and domestic. We ask for your protection over this great nation. Heal our brokenness and our divisions. And God, we ask that you would be glorified in all these things. We pray these things in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Please be seated. It is now my privilege to welcome Lieutenant Colonel Adam Hepe, Professor of Military Science and the Commander of the Bay State Battalion, Army Reserve, Officer Training Corps. General Barrett, President Leshin, General Catalinati, distinguished guests, and most certainly the family and friends of these outstanding young men and women, welcome. Today's ceremony is rich with tradition intended to honor these future lieutenants and ensigns. Thank you for joining us and being a part of this very special occasion. Commissioning is one of the most exciting moments in an officer's career and will surely be one that won't be forgotten. I would also like to give thanks to Chaplain Brooks for his inspiring words, to the Cadet Color Guard for their outstanding demonstration of discipline and respect, and to Mr. Doug Weeks for the beautiful music. I am honored to introduce to you our distinguished guest, Major General Maria Barrett, the commissioning officer for today's ceremony. General Barrett is currently assigned as the commanding general of the United States Army's Network Enterprise Technology Command, also known as NETCOM, or the Voice of the Army. Headquartered at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, NETCOM is comprised of over 16,000 soldiers, Department of the Army civilians and contractors, who are stationed or deployed in more than 22 countries. NETCOM's mission is to ensure the Army's freedom of operation in cyberspace while denying the same to our adversaries. General Barrett was commissioned in 1988 through the Reserve Officer Training Corps at Tufts University and most recently served excuse me, as the Deputy of Current Operations at the United States Cyber Command and as the Deputy Commander for the Cyber National Mission Force. General Barrett has commanded at the company, battalion, and brigade level and has also served as the Joint Operations Officer with the White House Communications Agency in Washington, D.C. General Barrett holds a Master's of Science degree in National Resource Strategy from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces and a Master of Arts degree in Telecommunications Management from Webster University. She is deployed in support of Operation New Dawn, Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm in Iraq. Today's ceremony is especially significant for General Barrett as one of our commissionees on stage is her niece, Army Cadet Abigail Silbert. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Major General Maria Barron. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and, and let's be thankful it's not raining yet. 
Uh, President Dr. Lori Leshen, ma'am, thank you for further dignifying this ceremony today with your presence. Um, as an Army senior leader, we always appreciate the support that the schools give to our ROTC units, and especially what WPI does through your leadership to the Bay State Battalion cadets. I'd also like to recognize also the distinguished leadership cadre of Captain Larry McCullen, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Heppy, and Lieutenant Colonel Jack Scowles, along with the entire ROTC support personnel who may be in the audience today. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for two things. First, uh, to what you spoke to, Adam, in that I know this invitation meant that I was going to be able to knock something off my bucket list, and that is actually commissioning a family member. But two, um, I do want to thank you for what you do for these cadets. Um, do not underestimate the impact that the ROTC personnel and the PMSs have on these future leaders. Um, as I spoke to the cadets before this ceremony and to the underclassmen cadets, uh, it really brought back memories uh, for me sitting in at MIT going through my own ROTC training 34 years ago. And I remember the PMS, Lieutenant Colonel Hammond, our tough MS3 instructor, Major Serafini, Sergeant Williams, our supply NCO, and Mary, the secretary who did our sessions packets and security clearances. I remember them like it was yesterday. And while your charges will move on to receive more training in specific um, specialties, you have given them vital foundational leadership and service skills. So thank you again for what you do for these young leaders. <laughs> to the cadets, I commend you for sticking with the program and graduating. You've, you have handled a double load. And most of all, my thanks goes out to all the families and friends present here today. These cadets would not be here without your support from their family and friends. And as you look at the program, you're going to notice that this is an absolutely stellar group of people on the stage. I, was, I have never seen a more talented and technically diverse group among people I've commissioned. As I stand before you today, I am reminded that our military operates as a joint force, and this commissioning class is proof that our nation continues to train as we fight. In this class, we have future Navy leaders who will specialize in aviation, naval reactor engineering, submarine, and surface warfare. We also have future Air Force leaders who will serve as pilots, intelligence officers, developmental engineers, civil engineers, munition and missile maintenance officers, and cyber operations officers. And last but not least, we have future Army leaders who will be branched in field artillery, aviation, transportation, cyber, infantry, signal, medical, military police, engineers, and chemical corps. No matter what branch of the service you are or what your job specialty is, all of you are leaders. All of you have the opportunity to command, and all of you will have challenges. So before we pin those gold bars on your shoulders, I want to share some personal insights with you. First, the importance of the officer oath. This is our spiritual foundation which grounds the profession of arms. Second, I want to describe the very special population the cadets are about to join, those who serve in our armed forces. And third, I just want to share a few thoughts as you embark upon this next phase of your continuing education in the study of leadership. Be prepared. This is not a one semester class. This is a lifelong study on not just growing your team, but growing yourself. Very shortly, you will take the oath of office, cementing your entrance into the officer ranks and commitment to the service to our nation. 
The oath starts with the words, I do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. This document, the Constitution, is therefore required reading. It provides our moral compass and who we strive to be as a nation. Because the Constitution was built on a series of checks and balances that distribute power across the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, officers must give their allegiance to all three entities, despite the fact that the chain of command leads to the president. These checks and balances create an inefficiency inherent in America's democratic system that often proves frustrating to military officers whose mission requires them to provide the most efficient and effective fighting force available. And while the president sits atop the chain of command as the commander in chief, we swear our loyalty to the concepts outlined in that piece of paper. And we are unique in that respect from all other militaries. We do not swear allegiance to a king or a queen, it is not an oath to a flag, the armed forces, the people of the United States, or the president himself. This Constitution has survived the Depression, recessions, the civil rights movement, wars on its soil, and wars abroad, such as the Civil War and two world wars. About two-thirds of the world's governments have constitutions drafted since 1970. Ours, the first of its kind, has endured since 1787. To understand the significance of the wording, one could compare the U.S. oath to the Russian version, the latter requiring officers to, quote, unquestionably carry out the requirements of all military regulations and orders of commanders and superiors, unquote. Isn't it a true blessing that America does not require its officers to obey unquestioningly, but gives them the opportunity and flexibility for innovation. But with that flexibility comes both responsibility and accountability for one's actions. Therefore, this Constitution forms the cornerstone of our oath and our service. With this oath, you'll join the less than 1% of the people in the United States who are currently serving either in our active or reserve forces. By way of comparison, my niece's university, Worcester State, will matriculate 1,300 students next week. Five of those graduates are sitting before you, awaiting their commissioning. Now, as a liberal arts major, I've been cautioned, never do math in public but this represents less than half of a percent of the WSU graduating class. And every time I have officiated a commissioning, the average remains about more or less 1%. And why is this important? I am not suggesting that the armed forces be larger. I am saying that these cadets are joining a very small group of volunteers who have a personal stake in the decisions of our leaders chosen by the people, the decisions those leaders make and don't make. You are entering into a profession whose concept of responsibility, accountability, selflessness, and sacrifice is like no other. To quote author Simon Sinek, leaders sacrifice what is theirs to save what is ours. I know your graduation from your respective universities or college is a big deal, but in my book, today is a big deal too. The beginning of something that is larger than yourself. Very shortly, you will lead enlisted men and women within the con confines of the United States or in some far off dangerous place. You will be expected to lead them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from military installations on land, sea, or aircraft in the sky. 
Now let me share with you some very simple things I've learned since the day I was commissioned that have kept me in good stead. Number one, your most important asset wherever you are assigned are the men and women under your leadership. Take care of them and they will take care of you. Taking care of your soldiers, sailors, and airmen means many things. Ensuring they are well-trained and ready to perform their mission, that they have the resources that they need, that you give them coherent and timely guidance, that you are competent in your duties, and that they receive discipline when warranted. The bottom line is, if you can't translate a task into what it means to take care of your subordinates, it probably ain't worth doing. Number two, listen, especially to your senior NCOs, chiefs, and petty officers. You might have a degree from WPI or another totally awesome Northeast school, but they have a degree and experience that you do not yet have. To this day, I still call a couple of my former sergeants majors. They serve as a wonderful sounding board, and I can count on them to tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Listen with your eyes as well as your ears. Listening is a rare and precious skill that very few master. Number three, soldiers, sailors, and airmen do well what leaders inspect. Set high standards, communicate your expectations clearly, and then hold them accountable. At the end of the day, your subordinates want to be part of a winning team, and they want a leader they respect and trust. Number four, you will fail. You will make mistakes, and you will get your backside chewed by the battalion commander. Get over it, fast. Learn from it. What you do with that mistake and how you learn from it is what counts. It matters. Teamwork. Don't be a spotlight ranger. One of the greatest joys of this profession is being part of a member of a team, performing a mission we all believe in passionately. You will join a unit, perhaps a company, flight, or naval division, with several other lieutenants and ensigns, all trying to do their best. Help each other out. Share the good ideas. If you do it right, your commanders can see what you do without a neon light saying, look at me. This also means giving credit to others often, especially your subordinates. We notice that. Six, the climate you set in your unit, whether it's your first platoon or flight or division, 20 years later, when you command a brigade, it is a force multiplier. If you allow people to demonstrate behaviors that do not comport with the core values, consider your own values compromised. And you can't take a measure of this from behind a desk and a computer. Get out there where your troops are, talk to them, and get to know them. It seems like a little thing, but small, authentic exchanges with your subordinates will speak volumes of who you are as a leader and build trust. A unit with a bad climate is like malignant cancer, tremendously difficult to eradicate once it takes hold. Seven, guard your reputation like your unit climate. You are a leader 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Lead by example. You are never off duty, and you should hold yourself to a higher standard because, trust me, soldiers notice everything their leaders do. Do not underestimate how much they look to you for guidance and leadership. Do not fail them. Number eight, grow your team and grow yourself. Always allow time for you and your team to train, practice, and constantly improve both individual and collective warfighter and technological skills. Know that you and this generation of cadets who follow are uniquely positioned to lead in our armed forces today and this operating environment. This environment is characterized by great power competition, especially in the areas of technology, information warfare, and cyber. 
Our peer competitors engage with us every day below the threshold of war. Your technical skills and ability to embrace and use emerging technology will multiply your combat power. Growing your team as well as yourself will require your time and effort to stay ahead of the adversaries. Read and stay informed. Become familiar with such concepts such as multi-domain, battle, drone warfare, space and cyberspace operations. Remain open-minded and stay cognizant of future military technological trajectories for they can change the current organizational doctrine in the blink of an eye. And lastly, in all the seriousness of this advice, I would tell you to enjoy yourself. This will be at times hard, and with this responsibility become, comes tough decisions that will keep you up at night. There are high demands and separations from loved ones. There will be sacrifice and at times danger. The leadership challenges you will endure will vary. And I offer you three achievements and sacrifices of three young Army, Air Force, and Navy officers. And St. George Gay, U.S. Navy, June 4th, 1942, he made the decision to continue his torpedo run on the Japanese aircraft carriers at the Battle of Midway, despite losing his squadron leader and every aircraft of Torpedo Squadron 8. Ensign Gay and his gunner were ultimately shot down, Gay becoming the only survivor of his squadron. The actions of Torpedo Squadron 8 drew the enemy's fighters to an ineffective altitude, allowing other American dive bombers and torpedo bombers to conduct follow-on strike and destroy the enemy's fleet. First Lieutenant James P. Fleming, U.S. Air Force, November 1968. Lieutenant Fleming, as a member of the 20th Special Operations Squadron, flew a UH-1F Iroquois transport helicopter to the aid of seven Army Green Berets on a reconnaissance patrol. That patrol had become compromised and surrounded in Vietnam. Fleming's refusal to leave anyone behind during the extraction mission set him apart from the average pilot and earned him the Medal of Honor. And then First Lieutenant Andrew Bunderman, U.S. Army, October 3rd, 2009. 61st Cavalry Regiment, Lieutenant Bunderman encountered a superior attacking force of over 300 Taliban fighters during the Battle of Kamdesh and the Siege of Combat Outpost Keating. During the initial minutes of the battle, the outpost suffered the loss of several fighting positions. While still in his Army PT uniform and flip-flops, Lieutenant Bunderman sent out a message for help and shortly thereafter issued the chilling message, Enemy in the Wire. In light of his commander's absence from the post and forced to take command of the besieged 52-man contingent, 52 against 300, Bunderman looked towards his NCOs for advice. His NCOs re recommended he counterattack and retake critical areas of the outpost. In addition, Bunderman began to coordinate indirect fire, close air support, and close combat attack to beat back the enemy. By the end of the day, Cop Keating was secured. Two of Bunderman's men received medals of honor. Nine received silver stars, including Bunderman. Bunderman's silver star would later be upgraded to a Distinguished Service Cross in April of this year. By recalling these actions of these lieutenants and ensign, I, I'm not here to scare you. What I am telling you, if you were to ask these three individuals if they saw it in their future that they would do utterly spectacular things for their troops and in the defense of this nation, they all would have said no. They were not too far removed from where you sit today in terms of experience and definitely not rank. You have this. You have what it takes. Go out there and do it. In closing, honestly, I wouldn't be standing here before you today if I didn't think it was worth it and I hadn't enjoyed it. My career has entered its twilight. 
The maximum number of years I have left can be counted on one hand, and if I'm really lucky, maybe two. Nevertheless, it's my job to ensure the next generation of leaders is ready to lead our sons and daughters and continue in this noble profession. I hope my presence here today and my advice to the cadets will encourage you to stay the course and serve our nation with the zest, love a country, and devotion a duty that I have found so rewarding. For when this day is done and the oath is taken, all of you will be America's next combat leaders. So, without further ado, let's transform these cadets into lieutenants and ensigns. Thank you, and may God bless America, our graduates, and those commissioned today. General Barrett, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts, wisdom, and truly inspiring words with these cadets and midshipmen. We are grateful that you could honor us with your presence. As a token of appreciation from all three ROTC programs, we want to present you this gift as a reminder of this very special day. In true WPI fashion, this gift was designed and fabricated in-house by one of our cadets utilizing 3D printing and laser engraving. There are only a handful of these pieces in the world. <laughs> Thank you again. Major General Maria Barrett will now administer the oath of office. All military personnel, please stand. Raise your right hand. I state your name. I, John Having been appointed an officer in the armed forces, having been appointed an officer in the armed forces in the United States, in the United States, in the rank of lieutenant or ensign, in the rank of lieutenant, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States against all enemies. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic, that I bear true faith, that I bear true faith, and allegiance to the same, and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, or a purpose of evasion, and that I will well. That I will well and faithfully, and faithfully discharge the duties, discharge the duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter. Upon the office of which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the United States' newest military officers. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now pin the rank on our new officers. This portion of the ceremony is a long-standing military tradition 
which highlights the significance of placing a higher rank on a uniform for the first time. In a moment, we will have the lieutenants and ensigns take their places. We will then invite their loved ones to join them and perform the honors. In the interest of time, we ask no more than three people join each new officer in the front of the stage. Please be prepared to return to your original seats within five minutes. At this time, would all loved ones please make their way to their commissionee. Commissionees, host.
Ladies and gentlemen, please make your way back to your seats at this time. Thank you. This concludes the pinning portion of our ceremony. We will now present the commissions to each new officer and recognize those officers selected as distinguished military graduates. Once the commission is presented, the newly commissioned officers will receive their first salute. It is tradition that the person who participates in this first salute receives a silver dollar from the new officer. This tradition has its roots in the, in the British military where newly commissioned officers were assigned to an enlisted soldier. Their enlisted mentor would train them, teach them the history of their regiment, and ensure their equipment met appropriate standards. It was customary for a grateful lieutenant to compensate this enlisted man with a small sum of money, a tradition which lives on and which we honor today. It signifies the deep sense of respect and gratitude which all officers have for their enlisted counterparts. If you are rendering a first salute to one of our new officers, Look to the left of the stage where you see Master Sergeant Zalai and Master Sergeant Blair, and please make your way to them at this time. At this time, I invite Major General Maria Barrett, President Leshen, Captain McCullen, Lieutenant Colonel Hepe, and Lieutenant Colonel Skiles to please come forward to present the commissions. Commissionees, host. Fidelia Buwachi attended Fitchburg State University and will serve as a military police officer. Lieutenant Boyachi will receive her first salute from Sergeant Akeem Dorn, United States Army. <laughs> Trevor Bonacorsi is a distinguished military graduate who attended Worcester State University and will serve as a military intelligence officer with a branch detail infantry. <laughs> Lieutenant Bonacorsi will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zalai, United States Army. Robert Chase attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve in the Cyber Intelligence Officer Corps. <laughs> Lt. 
Lieutenant Chase will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zala, United States Army. Michael Curtis attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as an engineer officer. Lieutenant Curtis will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zalai, United States Army. Grayson DeLuca attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a signal officer. <laughs> Lieutenant DeLuca will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zala, United States Army. Alex Donaher attended the University of Massachusetts Lowell and will serve as a chemical officer. <laughs> Lieutenant Donaher will receive his first salute from Private First Class Daniel Kane, United States Army. Mackenzie Eberhardt is a distinguished military graduate who attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as an aviation officer. Lieutenant Eberhardt will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zalai, United States Army. <laughs> Jonathan Evans attended the University of Massachusetts Lowell and will serve in the National Guard as an aviation officer. Lieutenant Evans will receive his first salute from Specialist Samuel Keenan, United States Army. <laughs> Helen Hale attended the University of Massachusetts Lowell and will serve as a transportation officer. Lieutenant Hale will receive her first salute from Private First Class Daniel Kane, United States Army. <laughs> Tess Hudak attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve in the National Guard as a Cyber Intelligence Officer.
Lieutenant Hudak will receive her first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zalai, United States Army. Rosie McCarthy attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a, as a field artillery officer. Lieutenant McCarthy will receive her first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zalai, United States Army. Joseph Melanson attended the College of the Holy Cross and will serve as an aviation officer. <clears throat> Lieutenant Melanson will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zalai. United States Army. <clears throat> Mohammed Jassim Mohammed attended the Worcester State University and will serve in the reserves as a quartermaster officer. Lieutenant Mohammed will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zalai, United States Army. <clears throat> Jared Rooney attended Worcester State University and will serve as a field artillery officer. Lieutenant Rooney will receive his first salute from retired First Sergeant John Kelly, United States Army. <clears throat> Benjamin Seitz is a distinguished military graduate who attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as an infantry officer. Lieutenant Seitz will receive his first salute from Sergeant Victoria Seitz, United States Army. Sergeant Seitz is currently deployed and will render the salute via FaceTime. Abigail Silbert attended Worcester State University and will serve in the National Guard as a medical services officer. <clears throat> Lieutenant Silbert will receive her first salute from Staff Sergeant Christine Tucker, United States Army.
Nathaniel Trisnadel attended Assumption College and will serve as a transportation officer. Lieutenant Trisendale will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Christopher Zalai, United States Army. <laughs> Chloe M. Clower attended the College of the Holy Cross and will serve as an intelligence officer. Lieutenant Clower will receive her first salute from Master Gunnery Sergeant Patrick Clower, United States Marine Corps, retired. Kimberly Espinoza attended Becker College and will serve as a munitions and missile maintenance officer, nuclear. <clears throat> Lieutenant Espinoza will receive her first salute from Master Sergeant Jolene Blair, United States Air Force. John P. Furter attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a pilot. <clears throat> Lieutenant Furter will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Jolene Blair, United States Air Force. Xavier J. Little attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a developmental engineer officer. <clears throat> Lieutenant Little will receive his first salute from Staff Sergeant Desiree Frumkin, United States Army, retired. Jack R. Marabello is a distinguished military graduate who attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a civil engineer officer. <clears throat> Lieutenant Marabello will receive his first salute from First Sergeant Paul Journey, United States Marine Corps, retired. Erica K. Reinertsen attended Worcester State University and will serve as a cyber operations officer. <clears throat> Lieutenant Reinertsen will receive her first salute from Chief Master Sergeant Mark Schubert, United States Air Force, retired.
Benjamin D. Schaefer attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a developmental engineer officer. Lieutenant Schaefer will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant William Kuhar, United States Air Force, retired. <laughs> Stephen L. Silvestri attended the College of the Holy Cross and will serve as an intelligence officer. Lieutenant Silvestri will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant Jolene Blair, United States Air Force. <laughs> Olivia Baranowski attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a naval aviator. Enzin Baranowski will receive her first salute from midshipman, second class, Olivia Ferner, United States Navy. John Kaler attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a submarine, submarine warfare officer. Ensign Kaler will receive his first salute from Midshipman Second Class Victoria Kaler, United States Navy. Robert Papp attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a surface warfare officer, nuclear. Ensign Papp will receive his first salute from Private First Class Andrew Michael Brenna, United States Army. Mitchell Postizo attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a surface warfare officer. Ensign Postizo will receive his first salute from Corporal Richard Green, United States Marine Corps. Eric H. Peterson attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a submarine warfare officer. Ensign Peterson will receive his first salute from Sergeant Eric E. Peterson, United States Marine Corps. Thomas Ralph attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute 
and will serve as a Naval Nuclear Engineer Officer. Ensign Ralph will receive his first salute from Midshipman Second Class Hunter Luddy, United States Navy. Jackson White House attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute and will serve as a surface warfare officer. Ensign White House will receive his first salute from Hospital Corpsman Dominic Walsh, United States Navy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating our nation's newest officers. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay standing for the playing of the Armed Forces songs. We invite you to join the new officers in singing their service songs. The words can be found on the back of your program. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the departure of the official party.
ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our formal ceremony. Commissioning class of 2019, dismissed.